Round three of the 2024 Six Nations has come to an end and after home wins for Ireland and Scotland, more refereeing controversy denied Italy a first ever Six Nations win in France. Today, myself and the columnist look back on the weekend of action before we're joined by Portuguese captain and rugby legend Thomas Appleton. Round three is done and dusted. Um, I was saying like just before round three that we were all unanimous in our predictions. We were almost all correct in round three of the Guinness Six Nations, but France, Italy bucked the trend of home wins and there's plenty to delve into on that front. We've got Portugal captain Thomas Appleton on his way in about half an hour or so, so stay tuned for that. But we'll start there in Lille. Um, our predictions for a France Grand Slam might now be the worst that there have ever been, not just in the history of the Rubber Paper podcast, but just in the history of predictions. We'll sort of go in re- reverse order. The last thing to happen in the weekend was probably the most contentious. Uh, Brendan, you've already told me off air that you have some quite strong feelings about what happened. Well, the- well, I did at the time. I mean, instantly something wasn't wrong, right with that kick. And it started even before the ball fell off the tee. That The cameras were flying around, at, you know, dejected Frenchmen when the penalty was given and 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 the bloody physio, right, French physio running on randomly. And you suddenly went to Garbizi, and there was only 22 seconds left on the clock, and he scarcely started his preparation. So I thought, number one, I thought, what has happened there? I don't know, but I think what happened is that the physio went and started waving his hands around, and, and with the three big players who were standing opposite him 10 metres away, this physio was moving around, and I think he was probably waiting for that bloke to settle down, thinking the clock had stopped. Anyway, I don't know that for sure, because we haven't seen the isolated camera. But then, I think with 12 seconds ago, the ball falls off the tee. Three of the French lumps start walking forward, which they're not allowed to do. They are just not allowed to do that. You cannot move when it's a penalty. And then two of them move back. One of them moves forward again. And the physio was still there busy around. So it absolutely had to be reset. There's, there's no doubt about it in law. And and the ref didn't do it. And he didn't allow himself that condor moment to just have a look at the the footage for 30 seconds after he, you know, before before he blew the final whistle. Now, in one way, you know, my heart bleeds frickly on this one. That was absolutely shambolic. But, you know, they had their chances to win the match. I thought, just I thought, possibly their try was a hint of a forward pass. You know, I'm pretty solid on forward passes, so I have to mention that. So, you know, was it daylight robbery? Possibly not. But a bit with Scotland the previous week, they got done on that final decision. And if rugby is going to be so pedantic about its laws, it has to get these massive calls right at the end. It has to make have a way of getting it right. Well, well, re- re- referees, to my mind, it's the spirit of the age now, isn't it? That they're 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 scared to act on their own initiative. Mm. They're in a sort of Lindsay Hoyle position, where if you actually go away from what's written down, all hell breaks loose. And there are accusations of bias or favoritism. I mean, I mean, if the if the referee had prolonged that, if he'd just taken a unilateral decision, which would have been in perfectly in line with what is sometimes called common sense, to say, well, the ball's fallen off the tee, so we're going to give him a little, we're going to give him a few sec- uh, seconds extra. Galtier would have gone into space. Yeah, but I don't think you have to do that, Chris. I, the ball falling off the tee, that's not the issue. That does happen, and that I think that has to be included. No, you're yeah. talking about the physio. Yeah, I'm talking yeah. about the oh, bloody yeah. movement by the French. It's, that is in law. That is well, in black and white. They can't do it. Well, yeah. that's just what we call pratology, isn't it? I mean, I, I remember Dave Tennyson doing something stupid like that. You know, he actually ran between the French kicker and the tee in Marseille. It was only a World Cup warm-up game, but it was quite a it was quite a significant thing. But you can't um, do it. It's, uh, well, it's you, you, pretty categorical. Kind of, he, he was a kit man, you know. Um, but I, I, I'm I'm just without trying to be too victim elderish about it. I'm just really sort of soul sapped by by the technology and the regulations around it, it just takes away the bog standard human... Until we accept that human beings will make mistakes and you put up with it because that's the way the cookie crumbles. That seems to have gone. We want definite everything. Well, cricket has disappeared right up his own bum in this series uh, in India because now everyone is moaning about Hawkeye. Yeah. Well, we all know Hawkeye's crap. That's why it's got an inbuilt measure, uh, an inbuilt margin of error. That's why umpires call is in. And rugby's, rugby has followed cricket right into the same dead end. 
The, the, you know, if, if, if all you want is certainty, then then sport ain't it for you. Go and do something else. Go and build a house. You know, do do some do some measurements. But we're taking the human element away from the game, and it's incredibly destructive. It's a shame. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I entirely agree with that monologue. I um, what I do think <laughs> is is that it's one of those things that you cannot. When you get involved in bringing high tech into sports, you look at American football, you look at the way in which they come to decisions and usually, well, 99% of the time, the correct decisions, they come to them very quickly. Their analysis is streets ahead of rugby and it's a problem because we're not using the, the, you know, the chip technology that there is to the, to the extent that we could and look, it, we, it, we, it is, we're stuck in a limbo land, basically. We haven't got the best of the tech world and we, you, you know, and it's undermining referees making decisions on, uh, you know, common sense decisions on the field. I agree with that. Um, and it's up to, you, you know, again, it's up to the, um, you know, the, the authorities, rugby unions and the world governing body to sort it out. Because it is beginning, certainly in this Six Nations, it's beginning to make a detrimental impact on the game without a shadow of a doubt. There's too much of this sort of nitpicking. There's too many cardinal laws not being applied. You know, the forward passes we've talked about ad infinitum. We've gone back to the bloody scrum put in, et cetera, et cetera. There are real problems with, you, you know, with just if you if you've got laws of the game and what, what you'd call cardinal laws, you have to apply them or you cut the ground from under your own feet. That's it. Yeah, totally. I would actually add, by the way, I thought Christoph really had a pretty good game other than he let Trelangi go a bit offside too much ahead of the run, which I think he's, he's going to get pinged for a lot. Um in future uh, test appearances. I thought he had a pretty sound game. He just got that bit wrong there. And he just didn't give himself time to even think it through. Um, now, you know, it must be very, very difficult, but he just had to give himself 10 seconds before he blew the final whistle when it went into touch there to think, right, what happened there? I just need to have a look. You know, if you're going to have a look at the TMO, that would have been an occasion to have a look at him. One door the... that's open, and we sort of touched upon it already, is as well with the shot clock and the introduction of it with something that is the elements interfering and the ball falling off the tee etc is Garb should Garbisi then be in his own right to pause the clock reset the ball and put it back given how rarely something like that would happen and how in um not in control Garbisi is over something like that yeah. I, would I think that's just random. And um, okay, so how, how it falls off in, in an indoor stadium, I don't know. But if you're going to have the 60 second clock, the 90 second clock, and it falls off, I think that's just a bit of bad luck. And that has to be built in. You know, you just have to accept that and get on with it. Like he did, actually. He reacted pretty well, I thought. Yeah. But, but if there's anything else that was wrong about that. Um, <laughs> Look, tonight, I right? agree with you. One of the things that I didn't understand, as you say, is that in an enclosed stadium, how does the, you know, there's no wind, or there shouldn't be. How does the, the the ball fall off the tee? Well, it falls off because he's teed it up slightly wrongly. So, but within the leeway that he's got, he should have the time to address that. The thing that was weird about it, you're right, Brendan, is that when the um, the, the the clock was eventually shown, it showed twenty seconds on it. Yeah, and, and it was almost done when he didn't even start his preparation. You know, forty <laughs> seconds of it. It was bizarre. Very Again, strange. I think he was waiting for this melee in front of him to clear in the physio to get the hell yeah. off or yeah. to sit down and be quiet. That's what I think he was doing. I don't know because we haven't got the isolated camera. Oh, of, of course, yeah, yeah, this, this stuff was brought in because because okay, with every action, there's a reaction, isn't there? Says yeah. the, the philosopher from just outside Bristol. The, 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 point, the point is Who that is? this stuff was brought in because the kickers were gaming the system. They were looking at the clock. Yep. And you know, just just trying to just trying to ensure that their kick because they're winning by a point. They don't care whether it goes over. They just want it to be dead. They want it to be the last act. Yeah. So they stood there, and, and we had those ridiculous things where people are standing there for ninety seconds plus, doing nothing at all but watching the clock. Embarrassing. Yeah. So they brought in the they brought in the kicking limit. But of course, the flip side of that is that if you have a genuine issue, 
um, as Garbisi did. And I think Brendan's raised some really, really good points there. I mean, the stuff that I hadn't thought of because I I, I actually only watched the game on, on, on catch-up for various reasons. And uh, so I wasn't really aware of of, of the, the sort of pre-issues. Um, I think if you're going to have, you're going to have this system, you have to have some flexibility in this stuff. The moment you're absolutely committed to the, to the comma and full stop on the rules, then I, I, I think you want the certainty on the one hand, but if there's no flexibility for a referee to act on his own initiative, I think the game's the worse for it. Yeah, well, the, the referee should be the final arbiter, but unfortunately, with the pressure that referees are now under yeah. in social media, yeah. none of them want to be the final arbiter. No, yeah. no. I mean, I mean, I mean, this, this whole thing about the bunker and the red card and the yellow card and what have you. You know, when did you last see a referee in a, in a, a bunker enabled match give a straight red? Yeah, well, he won't, will they? No, of course. No. Not. Anyway, how bad were France? <laughs> Shocking! <laughs> They're making idiots of us. They're making idiots of us. Their best <laughs> player was the T. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's in, he's in for the next two games for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's very well. Obviously, it's it's been um, slightly painful on my end because I've been working on the Vancouver Sevens and I've been seeing how Antoine Dupont is doing out there, and he's very much a fish firmly in water in in that department already. But I think this is borderline crisis mode for France, and I think we're all in agreement now. They should be zero from three. Yeah, they absolutely. should be, and we've got Maxi Mermoz on in a couple of weeks. Um, I'll happily say that to his face that they should be they they should have been zero from three. Oh, that's brave of you on Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Says the man talking absolute whatever about Manu Tuolangi last week when he wasn't even here. Yeah, well, um, yeah, Manu, uh, bless but, him. If only, if only England had had him at the weekend. I mean, I well, know, as it happened, Ollie Lawrence ended up having a bit of a shocker. Uh, well, indeed, well, in, indeed. No, we'll okay. get to that. But the, the, the whole the whole one man team thing. I mean, we were all quite dismissive of it. Yes, Dupont's a massive loss to France, but you know, hey, you know what? What you know, one swallow doesn't make a summer. Or whatever, you know, good as he is, but you are beginning to wonder now whether his absence mm -hmm. has had a really, really serious effect just on the sort of collective morale. I mean, they'd lost Audrey as well, obviously, for the weekend. So that's two of your best three players gone. Um, yeah. I think, I think it's do. a good point you make, Chris. Don't underestimate the value of greatness. And just quickly going to like Scotland, England. If that was a trial match and Scotland were in blue and England were in white, and you'd switch Dwayne Mandeverver over at half time, England would have won that match. He, he had such an influential. Um, do you know what, Bren? He was I've so influential been, on that game. You know what, Bren? I've just been through that. I don't agree with you. I don't agree at all. I think that England were. I mean, I was kind on them in match report in many ways, too kind. Uh, they were, their their errors were shocking. And they gave themselves no chance because I went through it. There's a 15 minute period from 55 to about 70 minutes. There are, there are 10 errors, one after another, that are absolutely at, in, at test level. They just, you, you know, you can't do it and win. I mean, and they're across the board. They're not, it's not just in one area. They are everywhere. You know. The... Oh, no, I can't disagree that England were very, very poor. But actually, if you take away three incredible tries by the South African, I don't think Scotland were great either. Yeah, I, th I thought Russell, I thought Russell was, for the most part, was very, very good. I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. You know, I mean, I thought, I think that they did what they did extremely well. It wasn't just Van der Merwe as a finisher was was absolutely out of this world. But you know, you look at the short pass, you know, to a Pilotu, to Hugh Jones, the way that Jones cut, you know, cut through that the fact that they they identified the weaknesses in the England blitz and 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 unravelled it on the occasions that they needed to. Look, Van der Merwe's second try was just, 
you know, was just a piece of really of individual brilliance. But again, Hugh Jones had the presence of mind to get the ball into his hands as quickly as he possibly could. But, uh, you're, you're convincing you know, me now, but what I'm saying is do not underestimate the value of greatness. And we're all, we, everybody sort of buys into this I, team I'm not sport, buying ultimate the team sport. I'm not buying the Big DuPont. players really make a difference. I'm not buying, yeah, look, they, they do make a difference. There's no question about that. But I'm not buying the DuPont stuff. Look, France have collapsed tragically in terms of their own standards. And I don't believe that that's down to uh, to DuPont. I believe that that's down to probably, you know, real fatigue among the players that they've got, yeah, a mental fatigue more than anything else. They just look half the players, all of them, look half of what they were. I mean, it is it is such a return to the old... You know, you don't know which French team's going to turn up stuff that it's not true. I didn't think it would be possible. I thought that the rigor that had been put into that side over the last four years, that there was no chance that you're going to get yeah. this, this sort of meandering rubbish. Um, yeah. and, and red cards have come back. And if you look at them, I mean, Jerry said something in his in his in his column last week, you know, that they don't look fit. They don't look anything like as fit as they did in the World Cup. No. No, no. They don't look as if they've been on the foie gras. <laughs> he, he's, he's also he's also gone for a lot of size, hasn't he, um, Galtier? Um, you 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 do think whether their defeat against South Africa made a made a dent on his sort of approach to the game or his approach to selection? Whether he thinks that pure size is. The next, the next step on for a French team, and we, and we also know that Galtier, you know, I was quite friendly with Galtier when I was working for the Independent, and but he he's a prickly character, and um, when things when things he, he was prickly as a player, and he he's had a rich history of ups and downs in his coaching career with with his paymasters, uh, and what have you, and you don't quite know what's going on behind closed doors there. Uh, because he can be uh, quite a martinet. Um, no, it, 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 similar to Eddie Jones, but dissimilar. I mean, I'm not saying they do it in the same way, or that Galtier's got the same epic sort of bunch of one-liners that Jones could come out with, or that he's as destructive to people to their faces as Eddie could be, as we know. But... Um, whether he's a popular coach at the moment and whether he's holding that thing together and he's everything he's doing is a positive vibe, um, I wonder. I do. I, yeah. Look, I, I feel I, I feel that you know the spotlight obviously turns on coaches. It's going to turn on Steve Borthwick. Um, that's you know that's the way it is. That's that's professional sport. But a lot of the time, the players get away. I think. Um, with a fair amount, and sometimes they admit it. You know, they 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 actually come clean and say, "Listen, it's it's on us." I think that it's the players who should take responsibility here. If you look at the way, and there's there 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 is a disconnect there. I agree with you. You know, you look at the way that Bordeaux have been playing, and they've got about half of the you know more than half of the French backline. The connection that they've got when they're playing for their club side is totally and utterly different to the connection they've got at the moment playing playing for uh, for France i mean they they're just they they're just totally they're erratic their you, you know their pattern their 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 style of play seems to have uh, have changed um because there's no real energy in their game you know they 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 appear to be in some ways I think going through the motions is wrong, but they just don't seem to have any dynamic about them at all. Well, if you want to see that, there's Dante. Dante's a classic example, isn't he? Yeah, yeah he is. Who, 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 in the lead up to the World Cup, was some player. Yeah. And, yeah. and he was a massive energy giver. Yeah. Now he just looks like a sort of bit of a lazy. I mean, I mean, the tackle was lazy. It was dumb. Yeah. Again, um, he's cost him a, he's cost him a, you know, a number on the field. The headline in Le Keep this morning is Perdue lost. They are. It's a lost team. And he got 1.5 out of 10 in the notoriously harsh French player markings. Yeah. Uh, 1.5. Yeah, the the England player markings almost. The, 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 the worst England player marking is usually about 
a four at work. Yeah. <laughs> Is that what Ollie Lawrence got on Saturday? Um, I've, I've seen threes and fours for Ollie yeah. Lawrence. Yeah. I've seen fours. Yeah. Yeah. You'll never have a, a poorer game than that. He's a no. quality player, but that was, he just, everything that could go wrong went wrong for the lad. Well, yeah. uh, Thomas Appleton is about five minutes away, and I think we've sort of mentioned Duhan van der Merwe, who, by the way, he's now got 26 tries in 37 tests, and he's one behind Stuart, Stuart Hogg for the all-time um, Scotland try scoring list, so he'll no doubt go streets beyond that. From the England perspective, um, the thing that I think has bothered myself and a lot of critics about England is obviously it's the work in progress, the lack of experience narrative. And Steve Borthwick is now well over a year in a job. In the match day 23, nine of the players were 29 or over. So, Kano, how long does this time bomb last of their work in progress before, well, we all and everyone else starts to lose patience? Well, I, uh, sorry, I, I'm, I'm going to, I don't want to tootle the old trumpet too much. Look, I wrote before the World Cup, I picked an England an England squad for the World Cup, which was based on a new team. Because I didn't see the World Cup, I didn't see England winning the World Cup, and I thought that the, any rebuild that Bo Borthwick was going to have needed. I'm not saying that you you he, he needed to go the whole hog, but the genesis of it needed to start there, and it didn't. And so he started this season with George Ford, for example, at, at, at Fly Half. And, you know, Ford hasn't, he hasn't been a disaster by any stretch of the imagination. But if you were going to look to build a new team based on a running handling game, he probably was not the man. And, you know, and we are where we are now. You know, I mean, we scra scraped home in the opening two games and then were shown... You know, our, our, our England's weaknesses as a team were highlighted in this game. Very clearly, this was a pivotal game, and it was a pivotal game that backfired badly on England. I, I mean, leaving aside... Oh, the back, leaving, too, leaving, too late starting. Leaving aside the bat line, Nick, and I, I, I agree, the, the work in progress, you don't, want to, you don't want to actually be old enough to retire while you're still a work in progress, do you? Um, <laughs> so that's all a bit of a nightmare. But the, the, to me, the back row doesn't add up. No. You're trying to you're trying to play this 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 slightly more exuberant all those words that people like Brian Ashton who were good at this stuff used to hate adventurous or imaginative or or high risk or whatever it was he used to loathe all that he said it's not nothing risky about about anything if you do it properly that was always his argument but if you've got two flankers if you you've got Earl who's outstanding but he's still a better seven than he is an eight yeah so in my book and yeah. you've got two flankers who can't give and take a pass. They're terrific at other things. Sam Underhill was... It, what Sam Underhill does, he was very, very good on Saturday for a, a chunk of the game. Roots sort of disappeared a bit, but we've seen a little bit from him early in the tournament, etc. But you've got your Cunningham Saths and you've got your Zach Mercers. These blokes can play some football. These, these blokes can have hands. Mm. And if you're going to play a handling game, try and pick some blokes with something on the end of their arms. Mm. <laughs> Jeez, that isn't rocket science. <laughs> I agree, I agree. Well, I think the other selection issue, and um, Thomas Appleton has just joined us, so this will be my last question, is on the wing. And Brendan, Emmanuel Faye were both, so I personally feel, made more impact in those 25 minutes than Elliot Daly has in the entire tournament. He did, um, because he wasn't didn't seem to be playing to a script. He, he, he's no, so exactly. sort of young and naive, in the best sense, that he's not bought into the, the England game plan. I mean, I thought the most depressing thing on Saturday was Ben Spencer, who no doubt a box kick, all right, after his Saracens days. He comes on and uh, this year he has instigated everything, Aquila, and a box kick on halfway. And I thought, where has this come from? I thought we were beyond those days. You know, England are chasing the match. You've been come on to, you're coming on to make an impact. You've been ripping it apart down at Bath with Finn Russell. Let's see some of that. But no, but no, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, he made a great impact when he came on. Um, and I think he'll start now against Ireland. I think um, he has to. Yeah. Right. Um, Thomas has joined us. Thomas, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hi. Hello. Oh, Hi. 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 Nice to meet you. How are yeah. you? How are you doing? Good. Good. 
Were you at, um, well, I know you weren't playing yesterday, but were you at Welford Road with the team? No, 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 no. We we stayed in Portugal because we're playing against Spain. Yeah, of course. Of course. Okay, awesome. Well, look, we'll talk a little bit about the, the game yesterday in a bit, but um, just while we've got you here, obviously, um, English audience, I'm going to ask, you know, about your career outside of, we obviously all saw you at the Rugby World Cup. You're a dentist and you told me you've got exams at the moment. You're also studying medicine, right? Yeah, exactly. I just I just came from the hospital, to be honest. Uh, wow. Yeah, I'm a yeah I'm a dentist. Uh, I'm an oral surgeon um, now, but I'm I'm finishing my my degree in medicine. I'm on the fifth year of my medicine studies, uh, trying to be an oral uh, maxillofacial surgeon. That's the the main goal. Wow. That's incredibly challenging, Tomas. If you're your captain in Portugal, who are now a serious rugby team of take the world have taken them to their hearts and you're still headlong in exams, professional qualifications, etc. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. It's sometimes it's it's not not easy to to conciliate everything and, and to manage in between trainings and and everything. But yeah, I'm 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 trying to do it. And I'm so, thinking one or two of your Portuguese based players have the same challenges. They're also got careers, and that's why we perhaps haven't seen so much of them since the World Cup. Yeah, exactly. So a, f a lot of them. So I would say half of the team. Uh, it's not professional. So we have other jobs. Some other players. Uh, a lot of them in consulting uh, area, like uh, big companies, uh, and around that, some others. Uh, we have our number eight, Rafael Simões, is a three D uh, designer. Um, we have, I think we have every sort of things. One of one of our coaches is a veterinarian, so we have a lot of areas. You remind me of Argentina in the old days, amateur, qualified professionals having to try to compete at the very elite level with rugby, and it's not it's not easy. And a lot of you have to go overseas. No, exactly, and I think I think Argentina is a really good example for us in in the long term. So I think we really want a, a I would say a similar path like Argentina. We need to. This is another another question, but I think we know we have Lusitanos. Is the our representative team um, from the Portuguese based players, and I think we really need to to go professional uh, on that team, like Argentina did with the uh, Jaguares on the yeah on the Super rugby. I think we need exactly the same. Yeah, yeah, but you don't have any. Obviously, a lot of your um, fellow Pedro Betancourt and. Um... Rodrigo Marta, they're all going, but they they're all professional. You don't have any aspirations, um, your end there. Uh, I think it depends on. I think it depends on the on the offer. I think there has been a few contacts, and I don't know. Uh, we'll we'll see. We'll see what happens. I was going to say post World Cup, I would imagine quite a lot of clubs got in contact. Yeah, it's it's not through the clubs through agents. Yeah, through right. agents. Yeah, we, we got a few. We got a few calls. Uh, but yeah, I think. But the thing is, for us and and for example, for me, for Nun Sozagaj as well, for Jerónimo Portela, um, we have a really a pretty stable uh, life here in Portugal. So it has to be a good a good opportunity for us to to leave everything and and go for the for the rugby dream. <laughs> and the game against um, against Spain is like um, sort of. England v Scotland uh, multiplied three times. There's yeah, a lot the, of love lost, is there? Exactly. The, the <laughs> history behind it is huge. It's huge. Is it? You probably you probably have no idea, but I do. I saw I saw a club game um, between a Spanish club and a Portuguese club back in the nineties, and um, they weren't particularly fit. But it was uh, it was like <laughs> warfare without the weapons. No, exactly. It is. It is because it, it has so many, so many history around it, and so many because we're the we're like the small little brother from Spain, and sometimes we need to to step up. And I think the rugby rugby pitch is the perfect uh, place to do it. So it, things sometimes get a bit uh, rough. So, so it's traditionally Portugal the underdog against Spain. Uh, and may possibly a slight reversal this time. Maybe Portugal with a team to be shot at for, by Spain. I think. I think if you look at the moment, at this moment, I think we're we're on top because, especially because of what we did uh, in the World Cup. 
uh, but Spain has a much bigger um, structure around rugby. They have a they have a almost professional uh, championship. Nothing compared to to ours. Um, but still, at the moment, I think we're we're. I'm, I'm, I don't want to say we're favorites, but we won against them in the semi final of the rugby yeah. championship last year. Um, it was it was a tough game, but still. Uh, we played at home, so we're looking really looking forward to it. When, when, when you play, fun. when you play as well as you did in the um, in the World Cup, Thomas, and and achieve what you did, and and captured the sort of imaginations of a lot of rugby, um, a lot of rugby folk who wouldn't have known you guys at all, really. But it was it was terrific to watch. How frustrating is it for you then to come off the back of that and be back in a situation where you're really not spending? the right amount of time together in in terms of international achievement. You're asking an awful lot of yourselves to revisit those heights when you're yeah. not when you're not playing together. There's the 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 pro the pro pro de deux, um element and why which is quite difficult to to manage and handle, I guess. Is it a big frustration for you to have tasted that, known what you can do, and then say, how do we get back up there again? Yeah, I think of course I'm going to be honest with you. It is frustrating, of course. So after you play such a big competition uh, as the World Cup, it's it's hard for you to lose a lot of players like we did. Uh, a lot of players, the clubs are not releasing them uh, to play with us. So we're not we're not playing at our fullest. Uh, but I think this is a bit of the Portuguese reality. I think we really need some changes and we really need to... I think coming a bit... Uh, back uh, about that Patrice Lajiske really worked uh, well with the with the French clubs and he really have the he really had a good relationship with them and it facilitated uh, facilitated um the relationship and the way that the the players could be released uh, to play with us and at the moment we're struggling struggling a bit with that so we're playing against Spain and we won't be uh, we won't have any everyone available as well. Players like Storti, uh, Rodrigo Marta, um, they'll probably stay uh, in France to play with their clubs. And I know there are a few laws uh, behind it, but still, it's 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 a it's a complicated situation. Um, but it's not it, it's not right. Uh, you know, I mean, in the playing in the European Championship, these players should be available to you. There's no question. Yeah, of course they they should. For in in our in our point of view, they should be they should be available for for every single match for for the for the national team. And I know it it happens with um with with the bigger with the bigger nations. Uh, yeah. The players are always released. It's always uh, happened. Yeah, exactly. They, they you always like England, Ireland, Scotland, whoever. Uh, they will always have their their fittest uh, team available. Uh, and for us, it's a it's a big struggle. But we've been dealing with this uh, in the past, and I think it depends a bit on the, on the clubs, with the relationship uh, with the French clubs, with the union, with the Portuguese union as well. Do the Spanish have the same problem? They got players in Pro D two as well. I uh, have... Yeah, they have a few players in Pro D two uh, as well. But I think they are. I think the relationship is is easier uh, with the French clubs, and I don't think they have that many. Uh, players, no. they have a few, but not that many. For example, at the moment, uh, I would say between uh, uh, top 14, uh, top 14, Pro D2, and Nacional, I would say something like 50% of our team. So it's I, I did it's a, a count the other day, I made about 19 of your team are based, are based or your largest squad are based yeah, yeah. in France. Um, Thomas, there is a bit of an upside to the situation at the moment. Obviously, you had Samuel Marquez retiring. Um, Portela is is stepping back a bit. But you suddenly discovered two young halfbacks um, based in France, but Portuguese qualified. Just tell us a bit about the two Ugos. And were they on the radar before the World Cup? Or are these lads in France promising players, but French and Portuguese qualified, who have seen Portugal and thought, I want to be part of that. I want to play that kind of rugby. So I think is So do you have no idea how many messages and and message that that even players receive from portuguese uh, uh eligible uh, players who want to to train and play for portugal 
you have no idea. And the union is constantly getting messages from kids from even South Africa, from France, for wherever in the world that after seeing uh, our Rugby World Cup, they want to be part of it. And the example of both Pugos was a bit like this. They were they were under the radar, but still, they're really young. Um, yeah. 18, they're, 19, aren't they? Camacho was 19. Exactly. They're kids. So they were under the radar, uh, but we have like a, a big, I would say like a big radar that have a few players and potential uh, players that have, uh, that could be uh, Portuguese internationals in a few years. We we tried some, for example, with this game, with this tough, really, really tough game against England Day. Uh, we send in a few a few young players as well, uh, even some French-based players as well to to see uh, to see them and to give them give them a few minutes. Uh, but for example, Yugos are are the perfect example for uh, of that. They were under the radar, but still they they show their uh, their intention to to play for Portugal, and especially after the World Cup. Who's faster out of Camacho and Storti? Sorry. Who's a faster runner out of Camacho and Storti? Because Camacho no, no, is absolutely no, 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 Storti, Storti. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's either quick. Still, Camacho is really, really fast. Yeah, it's Camacho's either... got the quickest pass though. He's got the quickest pass I've seen in a long while. England need a scrum half like him to be fair. Yeah. <laughs> Just get the ball out. <laughs> yeah, I, I, ha- I have to say what 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 worries me about um, Portugal's situation, uh, and and you're not alone in this. You can make the same argument maybe for Uruguay. Let's say. Um, teams who have gone to a World Cup and 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 won pool games or won a pool game, won drew, drawn a pool game, whatever it is, but achieved and and absolutely absolutely justified their presence at the top tournament. And you may well be there again in four years' time. And they, the 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 rugby world and the people who run it are going to expect you to rock up there in Australia and do the same thing. Because no one wants to see lopsided games. You guys have justified your presence, as I say. But without some kind of structural, regulatory governance help between World Cups, that's an awful lot to ask of you blokes, isn't it? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. So we, we went to the World Cup of 2023 because of, I would say, two... I'm going to say three enormous factors. So the first is you have a really, really core group made of players who want to sacrifice their lives for for rugby and and want to be present at the World Cup. After that, you have an amazing coach, a really, really, really good coach who brought the ideas, uh, his ideas for the Portuguese rugby. He had such a structured mind and everything in place and he from the first day he said he he just said what he wanted and in the end you had luck because you went to the world cup with a drew with a draw on the last minute against the usa uh, in dubai so i think if we we are going to be waiting for this to happen again in 2027 it won't happen for sure it won't happen so we we really need structural changes um in the union we need structural changes in in portuguese rugby i think we really need help from 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 world rugby i would say uh so i think it 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 has been 16 years apart since we've been in the world cup in 2007 and 2023 and if we want to keep waiting for it to happen again it will have to wait for another 16 years or even maybe more because other teams are uh, working uh, to be there as well so I think we need some changes. We need help uh, from rugby, from world rugby, and I think we we are aware of that. So what, what sort of help? If you if I, if I said to you, Thomas, what in practical terms, what is the help that you need most first? What are the what are the two? Say if I said two factors, what are they? So for me. The base is to professionalize the the Lusitaners, as I was saying, to have a team like Georgia has now with the Black Lions. Yeah. Uh, you probably have seen it. We need a team that is 100% professional, uh, that is the base of the national team, and that is playing in a high level competition. We need to give minutes of good competition and and good level to the players based in Portugal, because unfortunately, 
sorry, if Lusitanos were playing in the Challenge Cup, for example, in the European Challenge Cup, what sort of um, gate could they get and what sort of TV coverage could they get in Portugal on the back of the World Cup? I think what happened in, in the World Cup is everyone everyone had the team to, to cheer for and the the Portuguese players, the, the Portuguese fans, the, the, after the World Cup, the rugby started to grow uh, in Portuguese culture, a bit in Portuguese culture and it changed and for example, for myself, I, I noticed a massive difference uh, and the, the Portuguese rugby culture grow uh, grew um, yeah it has its growth uh, after the World Cup and I think what what people need and the rugby fans and especially the the new rugby fans need is a team to cheer and they cannot be waiting uh, for us to play in February and March and then we'll be three months uh, three months apart from to play again uh, in July and then only in November. Because if they have that, they will go straight back to to football and to watch football and and cheer for Benfica or Sporting or Porto. Uh, journey back to the World Cup a little bit, and we had um, a Portuguese journalist and friend of yours, as I understand, Francisco Isaac. He was on the podcast um, a, a few weeks ago. He he says hi, by the way. Um, just he sort of talked about the impact of the the World Cup and obviously that win against PG back home. Um, Talk a little bit about more about that from the first person perspective, and also just the overall experience of it—the night in France afterwards, etc. The meeting of Cristiano Ronaldo, who is quite a big name in Portugal, I understand, or somewhat anyway. <laughs> uh, yeah, just talk about it all. No, yeah, it was no, it was it was it was amazing. It was so. I'm gonna be so when we first started, we started our um, preparation for the World Cup in 26th of June. And being crazy or not, the first thing that I said when we got into the into the into a hurdle after the first training, I said, "You're gonna call me crazy, but we're going to win against Wales." <laughs> and everyone just started started laughing. And the day after, I said again, "We're gonna win against Wales," and just two of them, one or two, started laughing. And on the third time, no one laughed. And then oh, the week after, other people were saying we want to win against Wales, and then we started our preparation, just focusing on the game against Wales. And we did everything during the the three months that before the World Cup, just thinking of winning against Wales. And of course, we won. We we went to the game against Wales and we lost, of course. But not by but not by very much. Yeah, not by a good performance. Thank you. And no, but what happened is, we I, the. The seed, the seed of winning of of we needed something to shock the world was there, and in a really typical Portuguese way, we left it for the last time, the last minute, and I think it was uh, against Fiji, uh, and it, we knew, we knew, and we we had it in our heads that Fiji lost in 2019. They lost against Uruguay as well in the World Cup, and we knew uh, they were a team uh, that could, that sometimes they could relax. Uh, a bit and they're, they're the type of team that can win against England or Wales or Australia and they can lose against Portugal or Uruguay and we had that in our minds so that was the last time uh, we had to win in the World Cup and I think we really uh, we really managed to to do it and then it was just enjoying enjoying our time and enjoying the 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 history that we made it was the first points and the first win of Portugal in in the World Cup I think we had a lot of we had a lot of coverage uh, in the Portuguese media that we were not expecting. Our, for example, our reception uh, at the airports after the World Cup was insane. Thousands of people. Uh, it was it was like we were world world champions. Like thousands <laughs> thousands of people uh, in the airport um, waiting for us. It was it was really a moment that I will never forget. And after that, all of the all of the things that I, we had every. The media coverage, the the TV programs, the 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 meeting with the president, the, we 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 had the reception by the Portuguese president uh, at his residency. Uh, the day after we went to, we were invited to watch Portugal the football game, and that was the time that I met Cristiano Ronaldo because we went to watch Portugal against uh, Slovakia. Did anyone say who's that guy with Thomas Appleton? Sorry. <laughs> Did anyone say who's that guy with Thomas Appleton? <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> 
that was the day. Had Ronaldo scored his 125th goal for Portugal that day or something? Was it something like that? Uh, yeah, he was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was. It was. I think it was. I think it was 100. Or it was uh, 200 no. clubs, something like that. I'm not he, sure. He, he'd also achieved, I mean, not on your your magnitude, of course, but he'd, <laughs> he'd, he'd also achieved something that day as well, hadn't he? <laughs> no, but it was, it was really nice because I... I thought I thought they had no idea. I thought I thought that they had no idea about Portugal on the on the Rugby World Cup. And when I was waiting for the um, when I was waiting for Cristiano uh, in the door at the door of the of the changing room, uh, the the team doctor started to say that they watched every game of the of the World Cup, and oh. that was really really impressive because I had I know I know Bernard Silva, uh, I know him from quite a few years. Uh, and I was speaking to him, and I know he watched. I know Bruno Fernandes uh, as well. He told me he told me the game. He, he turned to me and said, "Oh, uh, that uh, that kick against Georgia. You shouldn't have missed that." <laughs> uh, so I know that they watched the game. So I, I was really impressed. <laughs> you you you, sp you spoke about Lejisque's impact earlier, Thomas. Uh, am I right in thinking that? Um, what what what? Well, there there are certain things that any side playing it at international level has to do. I mean, you, you have to have a, a, a scrum as best you can. You have to have a line-out as best you can, etc. But he seemed to me to identify a style of play, which he, he, he wasn't asking you to play like somebody else. Yeah, exactly. He, he identified a style of play which suited the skills and the sort of basic rugby culture that exists in Portugal and to try to maximise that rather than pretend to be the Springboks or whatever. Yeah, exactly. I think we really benefit from one thing because I think the, the you, know, you know the French flair. I think it really fit us perfectly, and Patrice Patrice is just that. It's he has he had a few details that were unbelievable. The way he analyzed the the opponent teams yeah. were absolute. It was unbelievable. It was amazing, and the amount of tries that we scored from during the last the last four years with on the Patrice Lajiske era. The amount of tries that we scored from first phase were, it were incredible, and I really think we he maximized uh, our uh, exact how exactly how we're saying uh, our style of play and uh, the things that we have. For example, players like Rafael Storti and Rodrigo Marta and Manuel Cardoso Pinto or Nuno Sozaguet, they need to to express themselves and they need to risk it and they need. They need to play from their own twenty-two if 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 they they feel like it. And Patrice never never uh, came up to us and said, "No, you're not playing from this," and we'd be really conservative. And he just wants us to risk it and to play a to play a, a an an attractive game. I would say yeah. that's not always the French tradition. Those uh, of us who have seen Bernard Laporte would say that um, um, there are some French coaches who say you're doing this, this and this. And if you do something else, you won't be playing next week. Exactly. But, but look, Legisque seems to be the opposite. Of yeah, that. exactly. If you look for, to some clubs of top top 14 and even Pro D2, they play exactly like that. They don't play, for example, they don't play in their own half. They Every time they have a possession in their own half, they'll kick it. And with Patrice, was not like that for sure. And, and his legacy goes on. I, I watched the Romania match and um, they were coming back into it and it was looking a little bit dicey for you. And you yourself started an attack from under your post. And I thought, hang on, this is <laughs> this is like Portugal really, really putting it on the line. And it came off. It, it got the the um, the mojo going again. It got the Portuguese game suddenly came clicked back into action because you decided to run it from under your post. Yeah, hopefully. I think I think we, we really started badly against Belgium on the first game of that of this competition but I think we with Romania really found ourselves I think we're in a bit of a struggle because we don't have um we don't we still don't have a, an official head coach uh for the future so it's it's in a bit of a uh, it's Flux. it's not easy uh, it's not an easy situation but still we have more time to train uh with some a lot of new players coming in and these are some some struggle that Every team after World Cup will have. I think this is the beginning of a new four-year cycle, um, and I think every team will suffer from this. Of course, I'm speaking about, about the smaller nations that have struggled with these. Because if you compare the team of Ireland of or even England, most of the team is the same that played in the World Cup. 
but not for Portugal or or even Romania or even uh, these. I understand. I understand, Thomas. If you if you can't really answer this, but um, I'll ask it anyway. When it when it comes to identifying a permanent head coach, a new head coach, Lejiske's long term replacement, will you as captain have any kind of role in those discussions, or do the players as a group have any kind of role, or is it imposed upon you? Uh, it's it's not a, an easy. No, of course. Uh, Nowadays, the leadership group has a has a worth um, has a worth on it, but still, it's it's not like we have a worth on it, but we don't have a no a strong opinion. It's we know beforehand, but we don't have that much to say. But so you, you might have some 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 input. But when the decision is taken, it's it's taken. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's take, taken by the um by the, by the union. Yeah, by the union. Is it likely yeah. to be a um a, an appointment where you get some help from World Rugby? Is it likely to be another overseas coach, or is it likely to be a Portuguese coach? Do you think? So yeah, we're having we're having help from World Rugby, uh, defining who who the next coach will be and. It looks like he's going to be an international coach. Um, it looks like it. Okay. So you, there are a few names um, have been mentioned of it, Thomas. Uh, you, you can't necessarily tell us, but th there's a, a strong candidate, is there? Uh, I'm not sure. Do you have any name that I don't know? Uh, <laughs> not particularly, no. I mean, you can throw almost... You can always throw Jake White into it. He's always a candidate for every coaching post there's ever been in international rugby, but I doubt if it would be him. No, yeah. no, we have <laughs> we have we have a few names uh, yeah. on the table, but no, still nothing, nothing okay. that I can tell you. Sorry, well, we, look, we look forward to finding out who that is. Just in terms of your own game as well, Thomas, you mentioned playing around the likes of Carlos Pinto and Storti and um, Marta. How has that affected your own game in terms of, well, you playing a la Portuguese DNA? You have a very um, concrete DNA and I think back for example to the the pass against um, Australia Tibetan court sticks in the mind which I think was one of the most um, the best passes in the World Cup actually do you does that sort of thing you know is that brought out by the guys you're now playing around no yeah for sure for sure completely because it's it's really it's really because our our style of play was a bit made uh, as well for them, for, or for the some other players in the back, especially the back three, to to shine a bit. And if you if you notice, for example, uh, Rodrigo Marta in four years time or five years, he's twenty, I think he's twenty three or twenty four years old, and he's the the best try scorer from uh, from Portugal ever. So our DNA is really made to to make these players shine and play around them and and. Get this really quality and explosive um, style of play from them, and I think this, of course, really benefits uh, me because um, it's a really, a really fun game to play and assist uh, assist this kind of this kind of players. I really think is a really a really good thing that I really like to do, and of course, I will never ex uh, never forget that pass uh, for Pedro. Um, yeah, but yeah, I think it really it really grows uh, my game to play alongside them for sure. What kind of condition, Thomas, will the team be in when you go to South Africa in the summer? So, I think, and I'm going to be honest with you, I think we'll be way better uh, than now because we'll have a lot of players um, that are not available now. They already said that they're going to be they're going to be available for the game against South Africa. Okay. Good. Uh, so, I think you're going to be. I think you're you're gonna be satisfied because we're gonna not the full World Cup squad, World Cup squad, but a few of the players that you saw in the World Cup are going to be present in in South Africa. And is it flying straight down one match, or have you got any sort of preparation match in no, South we're, Africa? We're playing Namibia on the weekend, oh, right. the weekend before. South and, and which one of you guys in the first two minutes of that game will tell Eben Etzebeth that he's slow and ugly? <laughs> I'm not sure. It won't be me for sure. <laughs> it, won't, it won't be me. <laughs> oh dear. Um, just a little bit about more about you. Francisco Isaac asked me to ask you, uh, and I can't remember when he was on now. It was just before the start of the REC. 
who's better at rugby out of you and your brother, Francisco? <laughs> my bro my brother is a brilliant uh, lawyer. Brilliant lawyer. <laughs> He's a good rugby player. No, no, no. Now, honestly, he was a really, really good uh, rugby player. Um, he was international for Portugal for something like 30 times. Um, yeah, but I think if you look objectively at one another career, uh, I think I will I will come up. Okay. Would he agree? No, of course not. <laughs> he would say he's better for sure. And tell us a little bit about the Appleton surname. I mean, we... We assume, and, and there's a huge link between, you know, Portugal and, and England. There is somewhere in your lineage. Yeah, so some, my great grand, my great grandfather was was English, uh, from, uh, from Manchester, and he married my uh, great great grandmother that was from Ireland, uh, and both of them flew to Portugal because of Catholic and and some Christian Christian. Uh, problems between Ireland and England yeah. when they flew to. to oh, well, have there been problems between Ireland and England historically? I went to Portugal for a peace, <laughs> peaceful time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you have you you may have a kind of English qualification. We do have some problems in midfield at the moment, Thomas. Would you <laughs> consider? Um... I, I mean, we don't need you to train. <laughs> just, just turn up. If you get me a, a job as a dentist there, I might think about it. Uh, I'm going this <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> Chris, and now you mentioned your dentist appointments, Chris, so much on the podcast. I hope well, you that's because they're care. costing me so much money. Yeah. <laughs> no, but Tom, we were saying actually that um, a 12 like you is exactly what we need for England, not that I'm asking you to transition. <laughs> um just while we that's a sort of feeder into the six nations do you watch much of the six nations when you're obviously submerged in rec stuff uh yeah i watch a few, we watch a few games especially in the days because a lot of our matches not this weekend uh not this weekend but usually our matches uh are on the same weekends as yeah. uh as the six nations and we a lot of times we we watch some games together um and yeah, but now we watch we watch the Six Nations not every every single game, but I watch a few. How, what have you made of well the way things are going so far? Ireland is, <laughs> is on the go, and no, I'm gonna I I really like I really like the the way uh, Ireland play and the style of play of, of Ireland, and we trained with them in last year before the World Cup. We trained with them in the uh, in the Algarve in the south of Portugal. And I was really amazed uh, about the the structure that they have and the intensity that they put on the um, uh, in trainings and everything and and their style of play is absolutely absolutely amazing. And they they are going with with three games uh, in the Six Nations at the moment, fifteen points if I if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, he's, yeah. If if not more, yeah. Yeah, I think they're they're the a solid candidate. I think Scotland is is really really playing in a an enjoyable rugby to watch as well. I think Finn Russell, it's it's a, a genius. Um, yeah, but I'm, England is struggling a bit. Yeah, and France could they do with Lajiski? <laughs> no, oh, there's a suggestion. Ooh. <laughs> Now Lajiske had his had his go uh, in France in 2000. He was a he was an assistant coach for yeah. France in 2015. Yeah. So I think he had he had his go uh, with the with the French national team. I think France it's struggling a bit uh, without Dupont. Um, but for what for what I saw in the sevens this weekend, he's he's really stepping up in the sevens as well. So you've played. Do you think if he keeps Sorry, at it, Dupont will be quite a good player one day? Sorry? Do you think if he sticks at it, Dupont will be quite a good player one day? Uh, <laughs> no, he can be. He can be a good player. <laughs> You've played some sevens, Thomas, haven't you? Yeah, I, I did. No, I played I played, I played, played some sevens. I did one year of World Circuit. Um, quite, a, quite a while ago now, wasn't it? Like 2013. I, I did my first, I did my first in Glasgow. My first, um, my first tournament in Glasgow. 
um, in 2013. Yeah, 10 years ago. It's been a while. I tell you what, Portugal now would have one hell of a set. If you took some of your boys over to the seven circuit, you'd have a very good sevens team. Oh, yeah, I, th I think so. I think so. As well. the, yeah, that's the one of the big problems of, of Portuguese rugby. We don't have that much depth. Uh, so it's it's hard for us to to have. To and, and you mentioned that, Thomas. As well. I'm just putting context for some of our listeners. Yesterday's match, the, the A match, I mean, it, I think it was good intention by England. And they wanted to give Portugal opposition, but you were never in a position to put out anything like a first 15 or even a second 15. So that was very much a development third 15. Um, exactly. Did you get anything out of it? I mean, I thought your halfbacks looked quite useful, promising players who might develop into your senior squad. It's. I think it's. It. It was. It was. It was really, really hard for us because honestly, it was not our first team. It was probably not even. Uh, our second team and as you were saying it was a development team a lot of players um really show their their attitude and they're they're willing to and they're available to to one day play for portuguese for the portuguese national team but still as i was saying we have a really we have a big problem with depth uh with player depth on on score squad depth comparing to, to teams like england and if we if you compare the players that were playing for england day this weekend all of them playing for in the Premiership, professional players, and Portugal. Portugal was playing with all of the players, uh, or almost all from the Portuguese national team. Some of the players were not really. Some of the other players from two clubs that had the semi-final of the Portuguese Cup were not released as well. Yeah. So in a in a in a universe of the Portuguese rugby that we don't have that many such a good internal competition, we don't, we even if we don't have. Such a good internal competition. Uh, some of the clubs are not releasing the players uh, for that. We don't have any other players available, so it's really, really hard for us to. to I think I'm right in saying that the Irish clubs, the amateur clubs, are going to put a 15 together to play play Portugal in a sort of development match. That would seem a slightly better arrangement. You, you can sort of slightly more equally match sides. Yeah, exactly. It makes it makes much more sense. Uh, yeah, makes much more sense like that because. To be honest, I think England's uh, A game would be amazing for us. For example, before the world, the, the game against South Africa, that yeah. at a time that we would probably have one month or or one month and a half of preparation, and we're preparing the game against South Africa, we'll probably yeah. have uh, we'll have our best team together, and that would be a uh, quite a few. That would be a, a good a good arrangement. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's, the, 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 um, in between in between the the group stage. And the semi-final of the Rugby Europe Championship on the weekend of rest, uh, we are playing against England Day. It would be yeah. really tough to to put uh, the best team. And yeah, I, I I think you make a really good point about the Lusitanos and and Nick was saying about playing in the Challenge Cup. It seems to me that 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 kind of thing is absolutely essential because if there if there's no if there's no pathway from from Portuguese domestic rugby up to something more challenging, and then up again to something more challenging. That's, that's very, very difficult. We've seen the improvements with Fiji now that they have teams in the um, in the in the in the in the Super Rugby um, Championship. Uh, we've seen it with Argentina, as you mentioned earlier. Um, but then, just never seems there always seems to be a blockage. There just doesn't seem to be either the will or the ability to change the status quo sufficiently to give what people call the developing nations the chance to develop. I mean, it's catch-22, as we say over here. It's just, it's just not a good system, but it's an unchangingly bad system. Um, we, need, we need things to happen. Yeah. We yeah. do definitely. I mean, it has to change. And, yeah, I mean, uh, your, your, uh, what you said about, you know, the benefits um, of a game at the right time which would be, for example, leading into the South Africa tour, would be very beneficial for England as well. And it's yeah. quite interesting how they managed to find a weekend, you know, in February in the heart of the, <laughs> the Six Nations and the European Championship to uh, to arrange this fixture. I don't quite get it, but um, there you go. It's uh, it's rugby as it is at the moment. It certainly needs to join itself up much better in many many uh, respects. 
and uh, to give countries like Portugal, we're all agreed that, um, you know, to have a, a void or no obvious pathway after a World Cup just makes zero sense. None. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Um, guys, just while we've got Thomas here, actually, I, I have, Thomas, I haven't told you this, but because we don't usually do it during the Six Nations, but I'd love to hear your answers. We usually do a 15 sort of quick fire questions section just about you your rugby career your life etc would you be happy to do that for us yeah 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 okay so this is usually i send them in advance this is completely off the bat so i apologize for the spontaneity of it um yeah okay, let's see. So if, if you're good with it we'll get going <laughs> nickname mazinho mazinho what does that mean in portuguese like Marsh in a like in a oh, short okay, like little thomas yeah. Like, yeah little thomas nice <laughs> that's not probably not a very nice nickname as a rugby player no 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 it was from, from kids from growing up yeah from when you were <laughs> when you were actually little best rugby memory best rugby memory uh i would say the fiji the fiji yeah. game yeah most embarrassing rugby memory the most embarrassing uh, recent, I missed one tackle in their twenty against Australia in their twenty-two that ended in a try, so that was embarrassing. Yeah, I, I, don't, I only remember the past. I don't remember that. Who were you tackling? Uh, Cody Betty. Oh, well, I thought you were going to say that. To be fair, <laughs> I think a lot of players have been there. Uh, yeah. Pre-game tune. What do you listen to before a match? Uh, nothing. To be honest, nothing special. I just put it on on shuffle. And it's going, it's going through. But I like um, some things that I like. Tom Mish, I really like Tom Mish. Oh, nice. So quite chilled vibes. Quite chilled. Yeah. No, not, not, nothing too aggressive. Okay. Post-game meal. Uh, pizza. Nice. Good choice. That's the same as mine. Uh, best player you've played against? Best player? I would say Johnny Sexton on the game against, on the training against Ireland. <laughs> What about in an actual like uh, in an actual game? In an actual game, uh, one of the players that surprised me the most was in the World Cup was Jack Morgan. Mm. Yeah, yeah, great yeah, yeah. guy. Yeah. Terrific. I was, not, I was not expecting. Mm. To be honest, I was not expecting that. Yeah, that's the Gisquet's fault. He didn't <laughs> tell you. He didn't. He did. What so, kind of coach was he? <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he, told us, he told us nothing yeah. about it. But, um, <laughs> best player you've played with? Best player I've played with? Noon Sozagaj. Favorite player right now? He's not, he's coming back again, but Lukanyuan. Nice. He's, br he's brilliant. Have you ever played against him? No. I guess you're, you're hoping to in the summer, or maybe yeah. hoping not Hopefully. to in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> Rugby Idol. Sorry? Rugby Idol. Then Carter, then Carter, one, one of, one of my rugby idols, Sonny Bill Williams at this time. Nice, Ryan for sure as well. Favorite stadium, favorite stadium, favorite stadium, Twickenham. Favorite gym exercise, bench press. Yeah, we've had that one a lot, believe it or not. Uh, mm -hmm. Occupation, if rugby didn't exist, well, that's obvious. That's dentist. Yeah, yeah, it's not, not, not hard that one. What if um, it wasn't dentistry? Apart what from medicine, medicine. Yeah. Anything in science. I would say I would say something like architecture or something like okay. that. Oh, cool. Nice. Uh, superstitions. Superstitions. I always um, get my so left left sock, right sock, left sock. Then the how do you call it the so it's you know the true socks the yeah. The white one. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, left, right, left, right, boot, left, uh, boot, right, boot, left, boot, right, boot. Yeah, left, again, right. exactly the same. Uh, rugby law, you would change. Rugby law, I would. There, there was an experiment, experimental law in in Australia at a time that it was the power try. That if the last phase uh, of your try started from your own twenty-two, <laughs> uh, the try will would be got more points, like eight points or. Oh, that would suit Portugal nicely. <laughs> yeah. that was, you only scored tries from your yeah. 22. Yeah, that would be perfect. <laughs> you, you, you'd, you'd never lose a game. 
you, you, you would have beaten England a 97 91. <laughs> And lastly, best thing about working in rugby? Best thing, I would say friendship, for yeah. sure. Awesome, amazing. Thank you. For, sorry for putting you on the spot a little bit, but thank you very much for that. Um, I love that power try answer. That's the most Portuguese rugby answer <laughs> I think you could possibly have given. Uh, just very, We'll wrap up in about 10 minutes or so, if that's okay with you, Thomas. Um, yes. Just looking ahead to the rest of the REC. So it's semi-final weekend this weekend. And then it's the finals weekend is two weeks after that. Am I right in saying? Yeah, in the 16th, 16th yeah. of March in Paris. So say, and I guess a betting person would put money on it being a Portugal-Georgia final. Granted, obviously, there's a lot to happen for it to get there. But say that does happen. What does that now mean with what happened in the World Cup? You mentioned the missed kick already. It was a hell of a game. And I mean, Storty's tries were absolutely unbelievable um in that match two of the tries of the tournament but yeah what would that mean uh to have a rerun at that and hope to avenge that missed kick no i think and we know we need since i started to play for for portugal i've never won against georgia and i played them a lot of times and i think i think we really need to change uh to change that we we have two draws in the last two years um but at the same time, in the final of the Rugby Europe Championship of 2023, we lost by 40 points. It was a it was a big loss uh, against them. So I really need think do we need to to step up uh, if we reach the final, of course. Um, but yeah, it's gonna be a, a big game. I think Georgia will come because one of the things that we spoke about before the before the World Cup is that Georgia. Georgia won against Wales, if I'm not mistaken, a, a few months yeah. before yeah. Um, before the World Cup. And we were really thinking that Georgia is going to reach the World Cup, really, really hungry to to reach, to to be in a good good position because um, they won against uh, they won against Wales a few months uh, before. They had a big chance and a big opportunity because the 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 group our our pool group was quite even. Uh, between the quality of the teams and every team can win or lose against uh, each other, so I think really Georgia really wanted to 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 put a step up, uh, to put their hands up uh, on the pool stage. And I think when they reached the World Cup, they didn't win uh, any game and they draw. Uh, they had the draw against uh, Portugal, and I think they really now if we reach the final, just to say this that if we reach the final against them, I think they're gonna they they won't going to want revenge. Uh, from us because the results the draw between Portugal and Georgia it's if I look look at it from a from a big picture is more positive for Portugal than than it is for Georgia in a World Cup so I would say they're, they're going to be they're, they're, they're going to want the revenge if, if, well, if, if we say Thomas that um the Portugal the the momentum behind you drives you forward over the next couple of years and you start and and you, you let's say you beat let's just say you beat Georgia the next couple of times you play them. So you're up there, you're right on a level with with Georgia. You're pretty much where they are now in terms of international performance level. Um with the new structures around international rugby and, and this new nations championship and what have you, where do you go then? What happens to Portugal then? You're you're in in a sense, you'll be as good as you can be in terms of performance because you're playing you're beating the best sides that are considered to be in your level but there's no access to the next level so what happens i think it's gonna it's going to have to be the i think the world rugby and whoever runs uh the in the end it's world rugby i think world world rugby will have to to open uh to open something or some path or some door for us to play it, it's gonna it's it's always gonna be difficult to to ask for a playoff uh for a playoff for the six nations or something like that but if we look into into a long long time ago also, uh Italy struggled to to get into the six nations as well it took them a while to get into the six nations but still 
I'm gonna. It, it, I, I don't want to disrespect it, Italy, uh, of course, but you know there is a gap between Italy and probably the rest of the of the other nations in in the six nations. It's not. I don't want to disrespect them, but it's there. So I th I would say that the the gap between them and Georgia it's the same that the gap between uh, Italy and the rest of the other of the of the, the other nations and it should be allowed the opportunity for Georgia uh, to compete. We had a few years ago, like in 2021, we had the Nations Cup during the Autumn Nations Cup. Yeah. Um, and that is, there is not an answer for it, but it, it's it's the start of something. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm just brainstorming. Sure. Uh, yeah. It, we should have a kind of a playoff access, something like that. To the Six Nations, it's, it's, it's hard to get it because it's not if I'm not wrong, if not if I'm not mistaken, it's not World Rugby who runs it. No, no six exactly. Six Nations is a private tournament, privately work, privately run. Its directors are the members of the six competing unions. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and look, I, I write about this a lot, usually very angrily because it drives me mad. But you know, when I asked a previous chief executive of the Six Nations about this very issue, he said, it is not our business to solve problems for the rest of European rugby. Yeah. <clears throat> Just last question, Thomas, um, my end before we wrap up, I think Kano might have one more as well, but obviously, again, looking ahead to that Georgia match, and I, I know as a professional athlete, you won't like to think beyond the opposition too much, but while we've got you, got to ask, um, Georgia's trajectory has been very different since the World Cup to Portugal's in that they have obviously Just, sorry? trajectory, like their okay. part. Yeah. Um, new head coach, Richard Cockrell, they've obviously had a more successful REC Rugby Europe Championship so far than you have, obviously, with your tough result to Belgium at the start. How are confidence levels at the prospect or possibility of that matchup different compared to the World Cup where you may have smelled blood a little bit? I think, as I as I said before, they're in the they're in a different they're 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 in the beginning of a new cycle, as well, and they for what we saw from their games and what we analyze, they're not playing at their best uh, as well as us as us and as every every probably every union uh, playing in this uh, rugby Europe Championship, and I think we really improved. Um, I don't say we we erased uh, the game against Belgium after the win against the um, against Romania but the truth is we we were struggling to go through um uh, these pool stages and in the end we we had a massive win and we went uh, in first place so of course we had our problems in the in the defeats against against Belgium it was we didn't have that much uh, time to train we we was a new a new coach uh, Daniel Daniel Lucard is making an exceptional job but still he's a world is a world rugby consultant so we really need to needed to to adapt and needed a bit more time to adapt. But I think we're gonna reach uh, the 16th of of March in a really uh, really uh, good form and uh, in a in a better way because we will have definitely more time to train, a lot of time to analyze uh, them, and I think we will be we'll be there really nice. But first, the Spanish have got to be beaten. That they'll be planning something. Yeah, it's what I wanted to ask actually. Um, Where's that game being played, uh, Thomas? And what sort of uh, crowd is it likely to get? To be honest, it's a, sometimes a bit is a bit of a, an an unknown uh, uh, data because so we're playing in a in in Stadio do Restelo. It's a it's a football stadium. It has like something like I would say like twenty thousand seats, uh, but still twenty thousand seats is not twenty thousand uh, spectators. Yeah. Uh, so, I'm not. I think with the hype after the World Cup, the game against Poland was not a great match. We played it in a really, really big stadium, but the crowd wasn't the crowd wasn't that big. I would say it's something like five thousand uh, on that on that match, but still was bad weather. The it's it was not so so attractive to play against Poland that it is a, um, a, a semi final of the Rugby Europe Championship against Spain once again. Our big uh, opponent from the from history, so I think this will be uh, will bring um, more attention and quite a. I, I would not say 
twenty thousand seats, but if it if it reaches ten thousand, I, I think we we could be. And and sorry, where did you say it is? Santiago de la Serra. No, no, no it's called Stadio Stadio Stadium. Sorry, it's called Still. Okay, and where uh, where is that? Lisbon. In Lisbon. It is in Lisbon. Okay. It's the same stadium we played Spain last year and we played Argentina fifteen and Italy. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Oh, well, so, so you're it's only a home crowd. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, that presumably that in a Portugal Spain fixture that's quite important. Yeah. And and if you end up playing Georgia in the final, beware because with Richard Cochran in charge, they'll run it from everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, both props and the hooker. Everyone from everywhere. <laughs> I don't think there's any danger of power tries with Richard Cockrell at the helm, is there? <laughs> they won't be scoring too many from their own 22, I don't no, know. No, that's for sure. <laughs> Not unless unless, unless they, uh, David Ninash really gets it. He can score from the, uh, from yeah. the length yeah. of the field on his own. Yeah. That yeah. Like, um, He's a player. He's a really good Yeah, really and good. the number eight's a good player as well, isn't he? Uh, Gorgazzi. Yeah. Gorgazzi, yeah. yeah. He's yeah. a really good player. Well, look, Thomas, we'll wrap up there. Um, really looking forward to watching you against Spain and obviously hopefully in the final against Georgia or whoever may, that may be. Um, yeah, as you can probably tell, we're massive fans of Portugal here on the Rugby Bay podcast. We absolutely loved um, watching you during the Rugby World Cup and we'll be keeping a very close eye. And maybe we can get you back on the podcast later down the line as well, because it's been awesome having you. So thank you so much for your thank time. Thank you very much for yeah. the invitation. Always and if you want to switch to England, I have Steve Borthwick's phone number. So um, um. <laughs> I told you, if you get me a, a job as a dentist, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> well, you, you can have one this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you so much, Thomas. Thank Cheers, you very bro. much. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of the Rugby Paper Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe on whichever podcast platform you use and recommend the show to your friends. The Rugby Paper is available to buy every Sunday. And to make sure you don't miss it, subscribe to our print, digital and online options at therugbypaper.co.uk forward slash subscriptions. That's therugbypaper.co.uk forward slash subscriptions to get all our content for as 14p per day. <laughs>